hey guys, just coming to you before this episode actually starts, um, giving you a heads up that this episode takes a turn, not in a bad way. I know that sounds bad. Uh, we started off talking about how Bub's Naturals got started. And as Sean starts telling you in the beginning of this, to know how Bub's Naturals got started, you need to know the story of Glenn Doherty. And as Sean got going, we just kind of let the snowball keep rolling down the hill and it turns into a crazy story. I don't want to ruin anything. Make sure you stay tuned to the end um, because this episode turned into something we were not expecting. So enjoy. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Cult of Recreationalism podcast. I'm Nathan Morris, and I'm here with Jonna Ward. Me? Okay. All right. So, so this is basically <laughs> the other episode that we recorded um, was episode like zero point five. This would be episode one. So, this is- I, right out of the gate, as a three way hosted <laughs> podcast of three different personalities, we're failing <laughs> miserably because one, you didn't have the jingle, like fired up two you didn't like signal who was supposed to say who's next and maybe introduce yourself nathan then jonna then me and that way we kind of like have a little bit of flow and then we can choose how we want to edit that together i'm not telling you what to do nathan but you know suggestions (laughs) okay so starting over with the jingle What's up, guys? Welcome to the Cult of Recreationalism podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Nathan Morris, and I'm here with... John Ward. And Sean Lake. And welcome. Um, Yeah, we're here. This is episode two. Last week, we just kind of introduced you, or the first episode, we just introduced you guys. I don't know. People don't have to listen to this weekly. They can listen to them all back to back. It's weird. Um, Or whenever they want to, like whenever. mm -hmm. Um, Like while peeing on a call with a broker um on mute on mute <laughs> on mute. okay because we're because we're courteous you don't pee into the phone and let people hear it you mute do you pee really quickly i kind of depends how much i drank i was gonna say cause I, mean, I don't like I, i've got a big bladder so like it's a long time like i don't i've tried that before it doesn't work <laughs> mm, mm. i can so. say that in my household the women pee two X faster than the men. And I don't know whether that's a biological <laughs> thing or whether it's just how it goes, but I also drink two 20 ounce smoothies most every morning, like giant kale, apple, banana, whatever I'm, whatever I'm putting together, flaxseed and they're, they're tubs basically. And I drink two of them. So I tend to be front loaded on my liquid intake. So my morning peas are definitely full. For for what it's worth, hmm. no, I no follow actually, up on that. Last, when we did the last episode, Sean. Well, I was gonna say I have like this giant cup of water. If you're if you're on the audio, you're not gonna see. If you're on the video, it's a giant. I just got really thirsty last time, so I made sure I had plenty of water this time. Good call. Good call. I also have yeah. a uh, container of water because hydrate or die, Nathan. Just Jonna, you got so, beverages. Uh, Oh, oh, she actually has a hydrate or die water I bottle. I do have a hydrate or die water bottle. Well done. I'm supporting my friends at Monument Ranch. Um, just for anyone who doesn't know, Monument Ranch is one of the best cat ski operations in the state of Utah. We like them a lot. All right. So here we are, episode yeah. two. Um, I feel like we should have a topic. We should have a theme. Um, do we have any theme or are we rambling incoherently for a while? We have a topic. So this one, last one was kind of a rambling explaining what we're going to be doing this time. I wanted to, I wanted to have an episode dedicated to a history of Bub's Naturals. How did it get Ah. started? All the steps of how it got to be where it is now. Sean, you've obviously co-founder been here forever. I have been around it or exposed to it for a really long time. And John has been working at Bubs. For, how long have you been working at Bubs, John? Um, almost two years, I think now. That's Getting close yeah, to two like years. Been... Okay. She's an old soul, yeah. so it feels thought... like she's been here a long time. I, yeah, I guess I just feel like exactly. I've like, 
John has just been around forever. Because I've been like on and off kind of since the beginning, like little tiny things here and there. This is the biggest role I've ever had with us, actually. <laughs> so, uh, absolutely, actually, hands down. So, Nathan, I mean, we'll rewind a little bit out of order. Nathan and I have known each other since 2010. So, early, early years of CrossFit, we were both supporting no. and helping. No. Okay, I'm wrong. I was in college was in 2010. 2011? No, I, I met you when I, when I when I didn't move to SoCal until 2015. No, here I am thinking that oh, I'd known you for a long, long story. time. <laughs> yeah, apparently not. Yeah, but you can um, go from there. Yeah. Okay. So I threw an extra five years on to when Nathan was basically <laughs> a teenager, and uh, that was not accurate. Um, well, we met at a nonprofit. We can agree on that. And we met through the yes. sport of CrossFit. Correct. There we go. That's all we need to know. Um, hey, I've known you for nine years. That's all we need I to... thought I knew you for like 12 or 15, but you know, what do I know? That's kind of crazy. It's been that long. So it's been a while, um, but yeah, uh, so but we've I... been working together on and off that whole time. And when the idea for bubs, which we'll dive into came about, um, we knew we needed a little bit of extra help here and there. And Nathan, like almost immediately, and this is in all aspects of his life, raised his hand and said, well, let me help. I can do stuff. And I think it just sort of started small with like a little bit of writing here and there. There were some content pieces and then it, it moved into social media, it moved into some other writing assignments. It was always seemed to be the theme, a lot of event ideation, whether we actually did them or not, there was a good sounding board. Um, but Basically, Nathan has been around and seen the different iterations of Bub and Bubs as a brand, as as an idea to kind of where we are today with like launching an official podcast and driving that whole initiative. So it's it's pretty cool from where I standpoint to see you go from, you know, I, I don't want to say marketing coordinator. I don't remember what your job title was at 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 the Barbells for Boobs um, charity, but from where whatever that was to being a gym owner. Um, doing some independent hustle contracting and obviously now launching the podcast. It's pretty cool evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's where was, you just say thank you. You were on the call when I got that uh, thing. No, I think I was, I was about to with a story. Um, yeah. Cause you were on the call when I got let go <laughs> and you were like, Hey, you called me back right afterwards. You're like, Hey, take tonight, do whatever, go, get drunk, whatever, do whatever you're going to do and then call me tomorrow. And then it was like, all right, so what's the plan? What are you going to do? And then, uh, was just figuring out, I went back to doing freelance for a little bit. And then <laughs> you called me and you're like, Hey, I've just been needing some help with some social media stuff. Do you know of anybody? I'm like, dude, I'm right here. <laughs> what about me? <laughs> let me just, let me just raise my hand real quick. Um, yeah. yeah in case you weren't paying attention. Uh, I'm right here. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. But so maybe three hours a week and it just turned into way more over time. So, yep. Yeah. Well, it's good. It's good when you do good work and you're consistent, um, it shows and then you become reliable and like who doesn't want to work with people that are consistent, reliable and, and coming up with some good ideas. So it kind of worked out. Mm -hmm. Similarly, I would say again, jumping around a little bit, but Jana, her introduction to the brand came, you know, I, I, two years ago, I think we can all agree 2022, everyone's fresh out of COVID. It's a little bit wonky and we have this growing brand and this need between customer service, kind of wholesale management, hint, hint back to the broker conversation. And Jana hadn't done one of those jobs, which was wholesale. Like she'd never been a sales rep or like been out there, like, you know, throwing it down to be like, yo, like you got to open bubs. Like you have to be a part of this. And we have slowly fostered, the inner sales maven out of Jana to get her not just helping people from a customer service standpoint, she can do that in her sleep, but really embracing the idea of getting folks to understand what Bubs is all about, our DNA, why it matters and why they should care to be a part of it and then converting them. Like I see that hunger in her when she's like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to open that account. She's like, Oh, Oh, you want to sell to the Las Vegas Raiders? Move aside. I got this one. 
it's awesome. So, um, <laughs> pretty cool. I'm, I'm psyched to have this team together and then obviously to have these conversations, but I think you wanted to talk about bubs, uh, kind of how we, how we got started. Yeah. So you just kind of talked about how John and I got started. Like I know I've heard the story. It always starts with, um, Heather, your wife brought you some collagen. That's always where I've yep. understood how, like the beginning, do you want to start there? Or is, is there something before that? Well, well, the kind of origins, like, Hey, where are you from? What kind of shaped the kind of person you are that would lead you on this journey? Um, and I'm not telling you what to do here. I'm just saying how I think about it. Cause it's my little brain that rattles around with this stuff. Yeah. Um, so I'll start I think there. Glenn is an important, an important part of this because it's named after him. So yeah, start with you and Glenn. Let's go from there. All right. So easy. So, um, I'm from Gloucester, Massachusetts. Originally I was born in Gloucester, Massachusetts. So have you ever seen the movie or read the book by Sebastian Younger, The Perfect Storm? Can't I think say I've I seen have. the movie. Oh my when God, you child. Hold on, when was it released? <laughs> you are a child. George Clooney, Mark Wahlberg. I say, I remember Mark Wahlberg. I remember when that movie came out, but I've never seen it. Okay, you both have a homework great. assignment. You both have a homework assignment. Okay? It's probably free on Netflix. The Perfect Storm. Please go watch it. Please go and do your homework. And don't talk to me until you have watched that movie. Except for this podcast, because that'd be weird if you just like hung up and then that was it at the end of the show. So... I'm from Gloucester. Gloucester is a fishing town. Gloucester is well known for uh, a couple of things. If you've ever gone to the grocery store and decided you had a craving for fish sticks, you might be familiar with a band called a brand called Gortons. Gortons of Gloucester. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. They have a jingle. I won't I, sing it for you. I like how but it is, goes John and I know Gortons, some, but we don't know the perfect storm. <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> So the perfect storm I mean, I was is in reference when that to. Came out, a, so I don't think I was watching that. You're old enough. You might have been interested in fishing. I don't know. All right. Apparently not. Gordon, Gordon. I know you landlocked Kansas people didn't know what an ocean was, but um, you know, just saying, it's a it's a big body I'm of water. From Missouri, do not lump me in with the people of Kansas. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> if you weren't such a Chiefs fan, I wouldn't make that mistake. Um, the All right. Chiefs are actually from Kansas City, Missouri. Whatever. <laughs> Kansas. So so you've got um you've got my hometown, big fishing town, and it was a really eclectic town because it was like half artist and half like blue collar fishing. And my dad was in the fishing industry and uh when I was about 8 years old my parents divorced. And I moved from Gloucester to Winchester, Massachusetts. I guess I was just turning nine. And Winchester is where I completed elementary school, middle school, high school. So, you know, like Winchester was really those formative years. And that's where I met Glenn Doherty. Um, I was a freshman in high school. Uh, I had technically met him in middle school, but we didn't really know each other. He was a grade older than I was. So... I knew who he was in like sixth grade, seventh grade. We hung out a little bit in the eighth grade, but it was really my freshman year of high school that, that we connected. And the reason was because he was really close friends with my brother, Guy. So my older brother, Guy, ran around with this kind of half misfit crew of high school guys. So there's always these little cliques like the high school football jocks, the wrestling team. And then there was this sort of mashup of guys that were like kind of half into hacky sack there. Everyone was listening to alternative music, which in the 1980s, cause I'm old was very different. So you got guys listening to the cure, the Smiths, uh, hoodoo gurus, like just a bunch of different bands that most of your average high school folks were not listening to. And I kind of fell into that category with a blend of edgier punk rock music. So I was immediately friends with guys that were skateboarding. Um, my closest friend during that chapter was a guy named Murray Bollinger. And Glenn was like kind of the most popular of the guys in this clique. And Glenn and Guy ran around all the time. And I was like the kid brother trying to tag along with them. And as high school went on, 
we became closer and closer friends. Like we just kind of saw the world the same way. And the little rebellious cue that we had was blended with the fact that we were both middle children in our families, um, older brother, younger sister, parents divorced, uh, divorce scene. Like it was just the, the architecture of it was really, really similar. And as middle children, we were often stereotyped accurately for wanting to please everyone. That's a very common kind of trait in that, in that space. And so we were, you know, running around trying to make everyone happy. And at the same time, we're total black sheep rebels in, in the middle of that. So go figure. It was, it was a nice mashup. When we graduated high school, Glenn was older. He took off to college. And then a year later, I took off. So, so after my freshman year of college, I went home for the summer and, and I was like blazing through college with like a 2.7 grade point average. In other words, I was just drinking my way through my freshman year, barely going to lectures and was, I was a hack job. I mean, I chose to go to New Mexico state university in, in Las Cruces, New Mexico, because it was a school I didn't have to write an essay to get into. Like I was such a dick in high school about college and my parents, you know, both academic successful individuals, they knew the potential of their children and they were like, Hey, you're smart. Like apply yourself. And I was like, I want to ride a skateboard and listen to punk rock music. I don't want to apply myself. And you know, I was just full of teen angst and all that crap. So, you know, I look back at it and I, I laugh at myself, but if I hadn't been that person, then I, I know I wouldn't be the person that I am today, mm -hmm. which is still part of that punk rock snarky individual. So I went to New Mexico State University because it struck me as the most punk rock thing I could do was to go to a cowboy college as a New England punk rock guy. And boy, did I fit in. But what I found is that, you know, like I always loved being around people and I always loved being around the energy of groups and I've always been a culture person. And so I went to New Mexico state. I drank my way through it. I made a ton of friends. I decided to play rugby, go figure. Cause my dad played rugby and I thought that was a cool punk rock sport. Um, and even though I love punk rock, I was also always a secret jock and I got in with like the rugby crowd. And I did all that stuff. And then when I came home my freshman year, I'd really, really loved snowboarding and I knew I wanted to be a part of snowboarding somehow. It was my extension of growing up as a skier. So when my parents got divorced, my mom bought all of us kids skis and started taking us away from you know, Winchester on the weekends and up to Waterville Valley and up to ski Pico and Killington and it was her way to connect with us and keep us out of trouble at the same time. So it was amazing. And I loved skiing. Well, when I, when I figured out what skateboarding was when I was 15, 16 years old, that was my expression of being a part of this hacky sack counterculture crew that Glenn was a key part of. I was the skateboarding wing of that and I loved it. So snowboarding was like marrying these two things that I loved. I love skiing and I love skateboarding and here's snowboarding. So I, I went all in on it. And so I came home from my freshman year at college. I'm hanging out with Glenn and Glenn was like, yeah, you know, school's okay, but I got this itch to scratch and I want to move to Utah and become a pro skier. And Glenn was a ripper. Like he, you know, if anyone could do it, it was him. Cause he just set his sights on things and it just seemed to happen. Um, and I was not a good snowboarder, but I loved it. And I was willing to try, I, I want to put in the effort. So we settled on Utah after I wanted to go to steamboat. We talked to our parents about it. Glenn's parents were kind of like, yeah, you know, okay. Kind of my parents were, had a very split opinion. My mom was like, yes, please drop out of college and get this out of your system because you're wasting my money and you're wasting your time being in college. Like you're, you're not a 2.7 GPA student. You should be a 3.7. Like this is a, ridiculous. Go get it out of your system. My dad gave me the ditch digger speech and I was like, well, the world needs ditch diggers too. And I was like, Ooh, all right. So my dad lit a fire. He didn't know he was doing it at the time, but he, he pissed me off. 
And then I was like, I'm going to make it. I'm going to get in magazines, which at the time was like the ultimate expression of being a, a professional snowboarder. And I'm like, I'm going to go for it. So I set out on that journey with Glenn. The original plan was to go to Steamboat, Colorado, because I had a buddy from high school who had been to Steamboat and raved about it and said it was the coolest place in the world. I'd never really done much out West, so I didn't know what to do. And we decided that we'd go to Steamboat. Well, on the way to Steamboat, I decide that I'm going to go down to Savannah, Georgia to work a little job at a bar and kind of hang out there for a little bit because I had a buddy in Savannah, Georgia. And I hung out there for two months, drank my face off, lost all my money, and didn't make any money. Um, I was down to like my last $500 to my name (laughs) and there was a job fair in steamboat. Glenn and my brother guy went to steamboat and I wasn't there because I was still drinking and partying in Savannah, Georgia. This was how irresponsible I was. So they call me and they're like, Hey man, like we're here and you're not. And I was like, Oh yeah, oh, I got to get on a I got to I got to get out there. Well, I didn't have enough money for a plane ticket. So I bought a bus ticket. I bought a Greyhound bus ticket from Savannah, Georgia to Salt Lake City, Utah nice. with literally my last <laughs> few dollars. To get there, I had to sell my entire CD collection. We had compact discs were a very hot item back mm. then. And I had to sell my stereo and I put all my clothes in a little backpack. And I had a snowboard. I didn't have a snowboard bag. I just had the snowboard. And that was it. I moved in a backpack and a snowboard. And I hopped on a Greyhound. And Glenn picked me up in Midvale, Utah, or wherever the bus station was, and just takes one look at me. And he's like, you need a sandwich. Now, And now that's Glenn. Glenn was there to help others. So I showed up, and I'm just a freaking mess. And him and my brother Guy had, you know, they they had this little short-term rental. I rolled in with them. And we hit the ground running the next day. We go right up to Snowbird and we hit the job fair. Um, and we, you know, we kind of just start our Utah chapter together. And yes, I definitely was a derelict at 18, 19 years old to try and figure that out. But we get up to Snowbird and I end up getting hired as I was a dishwasher and a baker's assistant at Snowbird. So I had like the ultimate night job at Snowbird. Huh. And Glenn and Guy, for whatever reason, couldn't get hired at Snowbird. Like they, no one would hire them. And then we're at like a major job fair with nothing but <laughs> ski bums, and those two couldn't land a job. So they end up having to go to Alta, which is the next ski resort up the hill, up the road, and they get hired as lifties at Alta. So we rented a little apartment off of State Street in Midvale, Utah, and you know it's a little two bedroom. Glenn and I share a room. Guy got his own room because he was a stoner. He liked smoking weed, so he had his own room. Glenn and I didn't smoke pot or do any of that stuff, so we had our room. And that was it, man. First adventures in Utah, and that led to about four or five years living in the mountains. And Glenn stayed in Utah. He worked all sorts of crazy odd jobs, which was just part of his eclectic person and personality. I was hell bent on being a pro snowboarder. Glenn wanted to be the skier. So we just set out on those journeys. And about four or five years later, I had made it as a sponsored snowboarder, um, you know, just regional contests, shooting photos, stuff like that. And I sort of chipped away at it. Um, I got really lucky too. Um, I met a couple of the owners of small little brands and we all liked each other. So next thing you know, um, I've got a free ride. Glenn hadn't made it as a pro skier. Being a a sponsored skier in the 90s was incredibly tough. The industry was hurting. Um, There wasn't a lot of money in skiing and snowboarding was this hot, flashy new sport. So I had a much easier time getting that free ride and kind of getting up and sponsored. So it was really cool to to be a part of that. And then my roommate, my best buddy, um, hadn't made it. So one summer, he's 24, he takes off and he goes on a surf adventure down in Costa Rica. And our, our one of our closest buddies and roommates, this guy, Marty, uh, Marty Weishart and Glenn go down there and they spend like two months down in Costa Rica. And that's the kind of stuff you do in the off season. Like you just go and have these crazy adventures. Um, he comes back from that and he's like, you know, while I was in Costa Rica, I hung out with a couple of Navy SEALs that were 
hanging out and living down there. We all surfed the same breaks and we're hanging out. And man, they, they told me I got what it takes. They're like, you, you, you got what it takes. You should, you should join the Navy and become a SEAL. You should be one of us. And it really got in his head. So he comes back from that trip. We're hanging out. We're kind of doing that whole like fall catch up. Like, what's your summer been like? What have you been up to? And he's like, dude, I, if I haven't made it as a sponsored skier by the end of the year, I'm going to join the Navy and become a Navy SEAL. And we went out and we rented the Charlie Sheen movie, Navy SEALs, to like get an idea of like what the job was. And <laughs> we're like, whoa, you're going to jump off of bridges? And like, that's crazy. And, you know, this was an interesting chapter in our nation's history because we had just had uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. I think it was what it was. No, Desert Shield, the original, um, you know, sort of protection of Kuwait after Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait. So we, we just had this incident happen a few years earlier. It was the first time in our lifetime that where we had a major, you know, international incident. The Cold War had just ended. So, you know, it was a very interesting time to be joining the military. Um, and remember, this is all pre-9-11. Like 9-11 hadn't happened yet. So Glenn turns 25. He hasn't made it as a pro skier. And he looks at me and he's like, well, it's time to join the Navy and become a Navy SEAL. So I drove him to the Navy recruiter in Sandy, Utah. Uh, I'll never forget driving him down there. And he gets out of the truck and he goes in and signs it away. And two weeks later, he's on his, off to basic training. Uh, a year later, I get the call to go to his buds graduation. Like Glenn made it through. And, you know, again, we were talking on pay phones. We weren't, it wasn't cell phones. We didn't have pagers, none of that stuff. It was, <laughs> you know, it was just like a lot of that back and forth. And next thing you know, like I'm standing down in Coronado on the grinder watching Glenn graduate from Buds. And it was like, holy shit, he did it. Now, the rest of us ski bums are like purple hair and mohawks. And, you know, we're all just a, a, a shaggy bunch. And it was really cool to see him make that transition. Now, when Glenn decided he was going to join the Navy and become a SEAL, I decided I was going to go back to college. And I was like, you know, I'm making money from snowboarding. I called my mom up and she was like, cool, you should go back to college. Um, newsflash, though, uh, you're paying for it because I already sent you to college <laughs> once and you dropped out. So you're on your own. And that was great because it was my money my commitment, I had to figure out loans. I had to figure out, you know, working, even though I was getting paid for snowboarding, I didn't make enough money from snowboarding to like have some lavish lifestyle. Like I still had to have a job. So I worked my ass off to wait tables, work in restaurants, be a snowboarder in the winter. And then I went to school every summer and fall semester to fill the gap in when most snowboarders were, you know, partying and having a blast. I was like, I got to buckle down. And I didn't go to Mount Hood. I, I, I went to South America a little bit and I went to New Zealand and stuff like that. But for the most part, it was school, school, school and really intensive workloads. And I basically pulled my degree off from age 25 to 30 uh, with a degree in political science from the University of Utah. Um, and it was right around the time I kind of had like the peak of my snowboarding career um, I got, you know, I had a pro model on Barfoot one season, which was super cool. Like it was just a neat kind of feather in the cap. Uh, it wasn't a very successful brand. It wasn't like I was a hot shot pro. I was, I barely made any money in it, but you know, I was able to travel the world and have these amazing experiences where I was like, Oh, I went to Europe. I went to Alaska. I, I went to New Zealand. Like, you know, these places I would never think I would be able to go. And then you get your photo in magazines or a video here or there. And it was just an amazing community to be a part of. Again, that community thing that I've always loved. And I found my tribe. Um, and Glenn was out, you know, traveling the world as a Navy SEAL doing his thing. And every time he came home, he'd fly to Utah on his breaks and, and pick up a pair of skis and go rip around the mountain and have a blast. So we've just always been tight. When I got done snowboarding, I, I kind of saw the writing on the wall. I... I remember I knew it was time to end it because I was graduating from college and I, I wanted that next adventure. And I saw the next generation of riders coming up and we're talking Chandra's and I was about to be 30 and I'm like, okay, it's time to walk away. Um, and they were just amazing riders. And I was getting ready to join the state department. So my whole job I felt was going to be graduate from with a degree in political science 
go into civil service and work for the State Department. And I could continue to travel the world on the government's dime. And it felt like a really good job opportunity. Um, you know, I didn't know where it would take me, but that's what felt right. I ended up getting a phone call from my buddy, Mikey Basich, who is a, a pro rider who's dating a girl on the Burton snowboard team. And he's like, hey, Burton's hiring a team manager. Like, you should, you should apply for that. And I'm like, Mike, dude, I, I just got done snowboarding. Like, I wrapped up that whole world. I'm done with it. I'm, I'm going to go work for the State Department. And he's like, no, you're not. You don't want to do that. So I think, and I will say this out loud to anyone applying for a job, some of the best job interviews you do are when you really don't care. Um, and I don't mean you don't care. I mean, <laughs> your life doesn't depend on you getting that job. You, you have a certain amount of flexibility. And I end up saying, yes, I will interview at Burton. And I got a phone interview. And the phone interview, I mean, by all accounts, I probably shouldn't have even gotten that. But it went really well. They liked me. Um, and I was super blunt and honest with them. Like, hey, this is what works as a rider. This is what doesn't. And they flew me to San Diego to do a follow-up interview. And I remember doing the interview at this guy, Eric Koch's house, who's one of my dear, dear friends. And the team director for Burton's there, the team photo guy, Blotto's there, and me. And it's the three of them and me. And we do this interview. And I, I guess I, I did a good job because they offered me a job a week later. And I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> They end up offering me more money. Like we're talking stupid money back then. Like it was like, you can't say no to this. They're offering you so much money. And I remember like, I got a phone call from Eric Koch afterwards. And he's like, Hey, like you're a snowboarder. This is the ultimate snowboarding job. And you're going to travel the world. You're going to spend time with Sean White. You know, that's going to be your main focus. You're going to live in San Diego. You're going to be immersed in the industry. Like, why wouldn't you do this? And I was like, oh, huh. all right. It was a good <laughs> logic. And, and the State Department job was probably going to pay half as much. So I was like, yeah, this is really good money. So I took it. And I had no idea, but that launched me on a path to be in the action sports, snowboard, skateboard, surf world. Um, for the next decade plus, like that was it. I, I, I went right into this space. Um, and it moved me to Encinitas, my best buddy, Glenn's down in Coronado at seal team three. So I'm like, Hey, this is great. It's like, we're getting the band back together. And another old friend of ours from high school, um, Andy lots had started a watch company in, in Encinitas called Nixon. So Nixon watches is here. Andy is the president of Nixon. Glenn's down at SEAL Team 3, and I roll into town as the Burton team manager. So it was like a bunch of hacks from Winchester all getting the band back together. Um, <laughs> and I've been here ever since. So the best part was that my best friend was down the road. Then Glenn moves to Encinitas, and I changed jobs a couple of times. Um, I worked for the X Games for a handful of years. And then I, I did a small stint with Tony Hawk um, managing one of his skate park tours. And then I, I worked for over six years at Quicksilver at DC Shoes because they own DC Shoes, which is here also in North County, San Diego. So I ended up getting hired by Ken Block, um, rest in peace, who was an amazing mentor. I, I learned a ton from him um, to run the whole snowboard, surf, moto, and BMX programs at DC. So I was like, I just kept getting these awesome wow. jobs that were just so much better than the last job. And you know, Glenn moved up to Encinitas. Next thing you know, we're two guys both getting divorced and we're roommates together. So like he comes up, he, he gets, you know, he's married, gets a divorce and he needs a roommate and I'm getting a divorce. So I need a, I need a place to live. So next thing you know, we're two guys turning 40 <laughs> living together in Encinitas and Glenn at the time had gotten out of the Navy and was contracting for the central intelligence agency. So he was doing security work um, for the GRS which was like the I think it's called I, global response system. Real quick, right? Sean, what what year is this to kind of get like just get people caught up with where we're at? Oh, so I, I took the job at Burton in two thousand two. So I had spent all of the nineties, mm -hmm. you know, in college dropout. That was kind of like from eighteen to twenty eight, and then up to age thirty when I graduated college. So that was like two thousand two. Glenn was in the Navy from ninety five to like two thousand six. 
Okay. So he gets out so of the So when did you guys moved, move in together? So so he had been contracting for the CIA. He had moved to Encinitas. I was living up the road in, in Carlsbad or something. And then he got a divorce. He had this house and he had to deal with it. I needed a roommate. And then he knew I was miserable. And so he's like, dude, what are you doing? Like, move in. Let's go. So he and he was gone half the year. He was deploying to, you know, Beirut, Afghanistan, Iraq, all over the world. And then he'd come home and, you know, he wanted a good roommate to be stable in the house and stuff. So that was it. Like we we're, we're both turning 40. It's, you know, 2010 or almost. And we're like, well, I guess this is the way <laughs> the cards have been dealt for us. Um, you know, we joke, we said, well, hetero life mates, here we go. Like, let's just go for the next adventure. <laughs> um, Glenn was coaching and I was coaching at a local gym in Encinitas called Seal Fit. Um, Glenn had introduced me to CrossFit in like 2008, which was a long, long time ago. We both loved it. It was super competitive. And, you know, that was like any good friendship. Glenn and I were always jockeying back and forth. Like he introduced me to running. He introduced me to cycling. Um, I pushed him on surfing. And there was a lot of that like kind of competitive energy between us. And CrossFit was like the ultimate expression of shit talking because you're on the clock, you're doing work. And, you know, he would just mop the floor with me. And every week I'd be like, I'm going to get better at this. I'm going to beat you. I'm going to beat you. And it took years, but like, that was our friendship. Like push each other, push each other, like get better, like improve, level up. And Glenn, you know, for those years we lived together, we lived together for almost three years. It was one big giant adventure filled with, you know, a lot of ups and downs, like soul searching. What are you going to do next? And, you know, we were both at this crossroads um i'm grateful during that chapter i met my wife heather um glenn really helped push us together like he was chuff like he wasn't just like you know a romance maker like he challenged me to like take my head out of my ass he's like you've got this amazing person right in front of you what are you doing and i am forever grateful for those for having a friendship that is based on that level of honesty and integrity is rare not super yeah. rare. I think we're all lucky to have that, but he just nailed it. And I'm really lucky to have that in my life. And I learned a ton from him, fitness, wellness, integrity, um, nutrition, like literally all of those things kind of came from this experience over decades with Glenn. So the CrossFit years really kind of pushed me into caring about nutrition. And that's, that's a good segue into Bub's. Those years that we lived together, Glenn would have these mason jars on the counter. And depending on what the day's activities were, he'd sort of point me to a different jar. And they're all like these white powders. He'd be like, Sean, we're lifting weights today. Uh, scoop of the creatine, whey protein, and let's go to the gym. And then another day, he'd be like, all right, today's a big Metcon day. Uh, we're going to do take those branch chain aminos and that hydration. And okay, just scoop that into it, shake it up and drink it. And then another day he'd be like, yo, oh, we're, we're, we're going on a 40 mile bike ride. Just drink that hydration stuff. <laughs> and it was whatever he bought from God knows where at some discount warehouse. Um, and that's what I did. I just, I scooped in whatever he told me to scoop. I never asked any questions. I didn't know what the hell it did. I just did it. Um, I'll never forget. He bought a jar of something called no explode. And if you guys know what no explode <laughs> is, that. it is this like yep. hyper caffeinated pre-workout garbage and he'd be like yeah we're going to the gym today scoop that in. and i like put way too much in there shake it up drink it oh, all down and i'm no. like walking around the gym like i'm frothy there's like <laughs> you know drool coming up this corners i'm like what are we doing and it's horrible stuff and you know we we do these workouts and practically have a heart attack doing them um but it was great <laughs> fun and i also learned about good nutrition not just no explode to be clear um but, you know, like he was tuned in, like he was paying attention to that stuff and he understood, he read the literature. Um, he was a medic when he was a SEAL. One of his jobs as a corpsman mm. was to kind of understand the human body. And he was always had this thirst for knowledge. And I was the guy who just kind of picked off on the sides like, oh, cool. What, what are we doing? Why? Oh, all right. I, that's all I need to know. You did the research. Like, let's go. And. Fast forward to 2012, and we're kind of in this this rhythm and ritual. Glenn deploys for three months a year, goes overseas, and I, 
you know, I, I'm at home, I'm working a couple of different clients. I'm doing independent contractor stuff. I, I was working with Converse Shoes and I had a business partner doing a small agency. It was very lifestyle driven. Like we're coaching at the Seal Fit gym. We're having a ton of fun flying out to Utah and, and going to Snowbird on the weekends or, you know, whenever Glenn was around because we had this this freedom to do all those things. Um, and we kind of had this big sit down in early 2012 about what's next. It was just like we did when we were 24 years old figuring out that next chapter. And Glenn said, I, I can't deploy anymore. I can't do this job anymore. I got to get out. He's like, I'm going to go to Utah. I'm going to go to the University of Utah. I'm going to apply to the PA school, the physician's assistant school. I'm going to go back into medicine and I'm going to get my PA degree. And you're going to take over the mm -hmm. house. Heather's going to move in. You know, um, he kind of told her that he kind of skipped that part for me, but he like mapped it out. He's like, this is what, what's going to do. <laughs> And we both, it was also that time like we didn't have wills or anything. And we're like, you know what? It's like, let's get official about this and make wills, like actual wills. Like, hey, if I die, you get all my crap. If you die, you know, like however that works out. And power of attorneys and, you know, all that executor of the estate, all that crap. And Glenn had this like, very really clear were, rule. Like, you made the joke earlier about like hetero roommate part life partners like we, yeah. hetero life mates the expression we life. used was hetero life mates because look at from our so, teenage years through our 40s we lived together and we're just in each other's lives like constantly even if, unless he was deployed in iraq you know for half a year you know like we were together we were doing the life adventures like you know we were hanging out with each other's girlfriends and like spending time together and just doing the hard things and, and the fun things like, you know, whatever it was. And again, like I'm forever grateful having had that chapter with him, having had so much of his energy around me and, and all of our collective friends, um, you know, there's this sort of collective sentiment around Glenn that was Glenn was literally the best friend to everyone who knew him. How rare is that? It literally yeah. everyone who thinks of Glenn that knew Glenn was like, yeah, he was my best friend. And I was grateful to have, to be able to share that chapter. So in 2012, Glenn was changing his plan. He's like, I, I can't do this job anymore. I need something new. And I was in a crossroads. I was like, well, I got this agency. I'm making a ton of money. Like it's super fun, but agencies are tough and I wasn't sure I wanted to be in that space. So we're just like, we're talking about that. And he's like, I'm going to go to PA school. Cool. And then we do the whole will thing. And it was like, okay, like Heather, my, my future wife was literally the witness, like the signed witness and, and our, our friend Beth teach, they were the witnesses to, to the, these wills, like, you know, like to make everything legal and official and stamped with a notary and all that stuff. And Glenn had this one directive. He said, look it, if I die, I want you to sell off all my crap and throw a huge party and just mm -hmm. go rage. And we're laughing about it. And he's like, man, you, you got to keep the cult of recreationalism alive. And, you know, that's a whole separate subject of the name of this podcast and why, but you know, the, the short story is, Glenn and I tried to recreate as much as possible. And the whole idea was work hard, play hard. So you work a shitty job or you work a great job. What do you do about it? What do you do with it? What do you do with your fitness? What do you do with being healthy? Like you go and fucking get after it. And that was a huge part of our lives. Like from being snowboarders and skiers to mountain biking and the cult of recreationalism was a, a funny thing that was started by Glenn this guy, Brian Curtis, a couple of guys in, in the SEAL community. And I was the civilian wing of that because I tried to fuck off and have more fun than any of them. And we all would get together and go on mountain bike rides and ski and snowboard trips and just have as much fun as possible. And it was always like a little jockeying about who could have the most fun. And, and you know, whoever, whoever won that award was the grand poobah of the cult of recreationalism. And it was actually a title. Uh, I'm happy to report that <laughs> for a good stretch there, I was the grand poobah of the cult of recreationalism, um, but it was all built on on good fun. So Glenn's like, I got to change this up. I'm going to go back to school. And he's like, if I die, 
throw a, a, a kick-ass party in my name. And I'm like, yeah, 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 you're not going to die. I'm going to die first because I'm way more reckless than you are. And then 9-11 happened. So Glenn, the summer of 2012, Glenn was supposed to deploy to Tripoli. So he was supposed to go to Libya. It was right after the country had reopened the fall of Gaddafi. And Glenn had gotten a bike accident and broke his hand. It was, was like May or June. So he was literally supposed to leave on a deployment and he got hurt. And he's like, oh, fuck. If they know I'm hurt, I'm going to get in so much trouble. Like, they won't let me deploy for a year. I need the money. I need the money to go to school. Like, this can't happen. So he lies. Totally lies. He's like, Sean, I'm going to tell them that my dad is sick and I need to help him. And I'm like, ooh, Ooh, I, uh, that's a tough one. But Glenn was like, it's the only way, like I can, I can buy a couple of months. I can rehab my hand. I can fix it up. And he did. And he ended up, the, the deployment window was supposed to be like June, July, August. And instead Glenn stayed home for that whole stretch, fixed his hand. He had to like do a shooting qualification in somewhere in Colorado. And I remember like he went out there with like a, a wrap around his hand and he like tried to wear like a long sleeve shirt to hide it with a broken hand <laughs> to do his shooting qualifications. And I remember he came back. I'm like, how'd you pull that off? He's like, eh, barely. Um, but he ends up healing the hand and then his deployment paperwork shifted to September of 2012. Mm. So he flies out like September 8th of 2012 we're talking like he barely got in country and i had an email exchange with him and a phone call like right when he got in there because like he had just broken up with his girlfriend and he was like take you know take care of her and all this and like you know make sure that everything's cool on the home front and then it's 9 11 he'd only been in country for two days and on 9 11 of 2012 I'm going to bed and this little blip of news comes across um, like CNN or whatever, or Fox or something. And it's like, Oh, trouble over in, you know, in Benghazi, Libya. And I'm like, Oh shit. Glenn's in Libya, but Glenn's in Tripoli. And I, I remember like looking at a map and I'm like, Oh, Benghazi's like hours and hours away from, from Tripoli. I'm sure he's fine. I write him an email that night. Hey man, heard there's some shit going down over there. Be safe. And it was the last email I ever wrote to him. And Ugh. I woke up the next day and it was all over the news. Like consulate attacked in Benghazi, Libya, but no one knows what happened. No one knows. It. It's, a, it's an unfolding story. Um, it's just sort of like something has happened. And I go to the gym and, you know, it's around lunchtime or something. And I get a phone call as I'm leaving the gym. And I look down at my phone and it's an 858 number but I don't know who it is. And normally I would never answer that, but some little voice in my head said, answer this call. And I'm like, okay, all right. I pick up the phone. It's just Sean Lake. Yes. I need you to return to your home in Encinitas. And they rattle off my address. Um, we'll meet you there. And I'm just like, what? I hang up the phone. And I just, a pit hits my stomach and I'm, I'm not even halfway to my house. And I get a phone call from one of Glenn's SEAL buddies, this guy, Brandon Webb, who just always seemed to know the inside track on everything. And he's like, hey, man, I think some bad shit went down. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just telling you right now. And I'm like, yeah, I just, I just got a phone call. I, I think some bad shit went down. So I pull up to my house, and it is just like something out of the movies, like literally out of the freaking movies. There's two black SUVs parked in front of my house. So I pull into the driveway, and I look over, and like a bunch of people in – suits black suits white you know, black ties white shirts get out and they're like mr lake yes I'm like we're really sorry to report to you that um glenn doherty was killed in action and i you know i knew i was like okay um i was glenn's listed next of kin on his paperwork which is pretty rare normally it's a family member but again like mm -hmm. had our life mate um that's just how we had things set up and they're like we, we need to tell his mother barbara um the news we have cars standing by and i'm like yeah of course like let the family know and they're like a lot of media is going to start coming around they just prepped me for everything that was coming and my girlfriend soon to be wife heather like she worked in media so thank god i had her around to run block i don't want to talk to anyone i just i needed to digest yeah. what was happening and then 
very quickly it, it kicked into gear. Like all of a sudden, like, Hey, four Americans are killed in Benghazi, Libya, two Navy SEALs, um, a Navy SEAL Tyrone Woods and Glenn Doherty. Uh, the U S ambassador, uh, Scott Stevens was killed and an intelligence or information officer, um, Sean Smith, like, you know, and they're flying to Dover air force base, the president of the United States, you know, Obama's going to meet them there with, you know, the vice president, Joe Biden, who's now our president, Hillary Clinton was the secretary of state and it all just unfolds. And so Glenn's family immediately flies to Dover. I'm in touch with like all of our friends and family about what's happening. And in, in within, you know, felt like hours, this national event is unfolding and I'm kind of point person to a, a lot of the elements. And it's like, okay, well, they're, they're going to bring Glenn's body to Winchester, our old hometown. They're going to do a Catholic ceremony and the town of Winchester wants to do a parade commemorating Glenn's heroism. And, and at the time, you know, this is 11 years after nine 11, it was the most significant terrorist attack on American lives it was all over the news everywhere. And I remember flying into Boston. It's like everything felt surreal. And this is like, you know, maybe four days after Glenn died. And we're in it. All of our ski bum friends from Utah, all of our high school friends, all of our San Diego friends, everyone converges on Winchester to be a part of this moment in history. And I remember like going to the funeral home, which I'd never been in before. I knew of it. And I'm like, I'm standing around there. I got to sign all the paperwork, like Glenn's ashes. Here's Glenn's different forms, his death certificate, like all this crazy legal stuff. And then we're like, okay, we're going to do the, the ceremony, go from the funeral home to the Catholic church and the entire street of Winchester, like every street along the way is flooded with children and parents and people holding American flags. And I'm riding oh, I'm shotgun sure. in the Hertz. Like I, I'm, I'm front row. I'm, I'm like, I don't want to sit in the back of the family. It's like Barbara Doherty's, you know, like, you know, crying hysterically. Heather, my, 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 my future wife is in the car with Barbara and I ride shotgun. I'm like, well, I'm going to ride up front with Glenn and drove through the we streets of Winchester. It still, still gets me. I didn't see that coming. <laughs> You're good. But the entire, uh, the entire town came together to, to celebrate a national hero. And obviously um, it was incredibly, incredibly powerful to see that and to be a part of that and to, to see, you know, the impact of, what his sacrifice meant then and means now to, to our nation. And, you know, when Glenn passed, I had service to, to think about, but, and there's a lot to that. And that's a story, you know, for another time, mm -hmm. but really celebrating his legacy and, and, and bringing that forward to the world became really, really important to me um, and to everyone that, that had, had affected his life, all those hundreds of best friends that mm -hmm. I talked about. So after Glenn died, you know, I remember sitting in his sister's basement um, with like, you know, they had a little living room area and uh, huddled up with a couple of friends from high school and Katie and Greg. Um, Katie was Glenn's little sister and Greg was his older brother. And Katie just had this energy about her. She's like, we can't just let, Glenn's memory die off. Like we got to keep his memory alive at the table. We should start a foundation. And we all talked about it. Like we should start a foundation to help solve the problem that Glenn never solved for himself. This national hero who laid down his life in Benghazi, saving Americans still had this one thing that he couldn't figure out what he was going to do next. And the, and the real tragedy to me mm -hmm. was that he actually had finally, figured out going back to school and becoming a physician's assistant after, you know, almost a decade of, of contracting these high danger environments to, to just to know what was next. So yeah, we should start a foundation, the Glenn Doherty Memorial foundation, which funny enough, 
the acronym for that is GDMF. How poetic <laughs> of an acronym <laughs> <laughs> for GDMF to be yeah. what yeah. it was. To, and the whole design <laughs> of the foundation was to help special operators transition out of active duty to civilian life, fill gaps in the GI Bill, help these special operators figure out what's next. You want to go to school? We got you. You want to continue your education? Arm yourself with knowledge just like Glenwood. This guy who stood for self-improvement, what better way to improve yourself than to go back into academia, <laughs> figure out what you want to do next, and apply yourself? Um, so the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation, GDMF, um, and um, a prize pack to the first person who who guesses where my head goes to that acronym. <laughs> um <laughs> got launched very quickly because we had national press and attention around this. So the 501c3 was established by early 2013. Um, Senator Markey, uh, Massachusetts Senator, was right there to help drive that home. And we started kicking out scholarships, you know, by I think early 2014. We 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 had enough money to create an endowment for the foundation because um, we knew we didn't know how long we were going to do this. So we figured, hey, let's be smart with the money and allow this investment to happen and, and, and live on potentially in perpetuity. And that was Glenn's foundation. So I, I was right there at the very beginning of that, just kind of celebrating Glenn's legacy. Um, and now to, back to Bubs. Hey, here we are an hour later. Um, fast forward <laughs> Hold to on. go ahead. I would say you, this, I like this stuff about Glenn way better. I say we do what, like just keep talking about Glenn. We'll do how Bub's Naturals because that's going to be – it's going to be just as long. But like keep going on this because like this is a lot of stuff I've never heard and it's actually helping yeah. me put together. Yeah. Like, when you were talking about um, how Glenn is a friend to everyone, I almost – like for those – I've done a lot of writing for Bub's and blog and like some of the stuff I've had to like write about. I'm like, man, this guy sounds awesome. I want to hang out with this guy. And I, I never got a chance to meet him. Yeah. But like I well, never met him and I think you, of him as like – my best friend, like, mm -hmm. like, you just like, feel, like Glenn, you feel it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, Glenn was at the very first parking lot barbells for boobs event. He was there yeah, doing the, race, the very first one. Like I've got the photos and I'm like, of course he was him and Ziona and like the whole crew. Um, but no, keep, the, keep the, going. The, like the, when Glenn died, you know, you, you, you've got this foundation gets started. And, and we had this energy of like, how do you take grief and turn it into action? How do you take mourning mm. and, you know, and create something positive out of it? And the foundation really felt awesome. I, I think you, you see a lot of foundations jump up and, and get started that way. There was a whole nother thing that was happening at the same time. And, and again, I was this point person, the executor of Glenn's estate. Um, and, and for anyone who's ever had to be an executor, my heart goes out to you because I don't care how well anyone's paperwork or, 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 or pathways or usernames and passwords and all that stuff is set up. It's a goddamn nightmare. And in 2012, yeah. 13, 14, 15, like it took years to go through that whole process. But, you know, I, I remember when Glenn's, uh, personal belongings were mailed back to me um, after the terror attacks. It, it, it took like two months and I got his BlackBerry phone and I got his, his laptop computer and his bag, which was my bag. I'd loaned it to him. Um, and like, I get all this stuff back. I'm like, thanks man. Well, at least I got my bag back. Um, and I got to <laughs> figure out his passwords. Like how do I get into his computer to access his email to look up, Glenn's life insurance policy. Like I didn't have access to any of that stuff. We didn't, I wasn't yeah. set up to do any of that. And it started me on this journey of like, okay, I had, I knew Glenn had a bank account at Chase bank. So I got to walk into Chase and be like, here's my executor documents. Here's my power of attorney. Here's all of this. That takes four or five months. And here's Glenn's mortgage. And what, you know, I learned some really hard lessons in there where like when someone dies, you know, like with the way Glenn's mortgages were set up, he had two properties, a, a condo down in North Park in San Diego and our house in Encinitas that we both lived at together. And 
they were a nightmare to to unwind. And remember, like 2012 was in the middle of the recession. So mm. he had bought both properties like when the values were up here and then now the values were half oh, no. of what they were then. And he had mortgages on both of them. They were totally upside down and it was crazy. So I'm like, okay, I, I have to manage this. Glenn had liquid money. You know, I can't remember how much he had. It was like, you know, call it $200,000 less, $150,000, something like that. And he owed like $400,000 on the properties. Like the properties totally wiped out the value of his cash. So I'm like, well, shit, how am I going to deal with this? And I went to his family and I remember t sitting down and talking with him. I'm like, okay, here, here's the plan. Technically, Glenn left everything to me. Like every dollar to his name was left to me. Well, that's actually a negative. We don't like that. Um, and I'm not going to do what Glenn wanted me to do. I'm going to piss him off. And Glenn wanted me to take all of his money and throw a big party. And I'm not going to do that. I'm going to throw a great party, but I'm not going to spend all of his money on the party. I'm going to take his cash liquid money and I'm going to divide it by four. And Barbara's mom, like, you're going to get a quarter of it. Katie, you're going to get a quarter of it. Greg, you're going to get a quarter of it. And I'm going to save a quarter of it. And I'm going to take that money. And I think it was like 40, 30, $40,000. And I'm going to start an investment account. And I'm going to call that investment account the cult of recreationalism. And I'm going to invest that money. And I'm going to throw parties with our friends. And I'm going to grow that money and invest that money and grow that money. And every year, a couple of years, we're going to throw a party and I'm going to take everyone out to dinner. Um, I'm going to take people heli skiing. I'm going to do whatever the adventures are that Glenn would want me to do. And I'm going to keep doing that as long as I can to stretch out his legacy and do what Glenn wanted me to do with it. And the rest of it, it just felt right. Like, I, like look, at give his mom the respect and, the, and, 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 and that settlement for laying down his life. And then I'm going to take on the burden of the properties, which were completely screwed. And I had money saved. So I had to buy Glenn's townhome outright. I couldn't afford it. Was, I couldn't afford the mortgage, but also like I wasn't going to qualify for two mortgages. Like I just, I wasn't in a position to do that, but I had money saved. So I bought that townhome outright. And then I had a renter in it. So I just let it be rented. And that was the easiest way to manage that. And then I had to buy out Glenn's Encinitas house from that mortgage. And that took three years, three years of navigating like the paperwork and all that. So that's one side of the estate stuff. And it's probably too much information for people. The other side to it was this life insurance policy that Glenn was mandated to have by the federal government, by the, by the central intelligence agency, Glenn had to have a life insurance policy. And he had a policy with a company called Rutherford Insurance. And he literally couldn't deploy overseas without a life insurance policy. Well, the details of this life insurance policy came to light to me soon after Glenn died. Once I got into his computer, cracked his passwords, opened it up, got into his email accounts and, and, and found the paper trail. And thankfully, Glenn was a well-organized individual and I was able to like locate the policy I call up the Rutherford insurance people and end up, you know, emails back and forth. And they're like, yeah, we're, we're not going to pay this. I'm like, <laughs> the what, what? And they're like, we're not going to pay this. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, our client Glenn Doherty um, fell into a clause in this contract. Um, this life insurance policy is subject to uh, uh, this piece of legislation called the defense base act DBA. And um, Glenn, you see, was single and had no dependents. Therefore, it doesn't trigger the life insurance policy. We're sorry. Have a nice day. Click. And I'm like, um, <laughs> yeah, that, that ain't going down like that. So I had had um, a legal team raise their hands. K&L Gates, a, a great national like, giant lawyer team, raised their hands and said, hey, you're going to need some help navigating all this. Trust us. We know. Glenn was a great American <laughs> hero. We're, we're going to help you out. So they appoint me an attorney, a guy named Michael Mortensen, out of their California office. And we start talking about this life insurance policy. And I'm like, I'm fucking suing the U.S. government. I'm going after them. Fuck them. Fuck this. Fuck you if you don't agree with me. Like, 
fuck everyone. I was so mad. And that's part of, I think, the grief cycle and oh, putting sure. that energy to work. Like, hey, the foundation's great. We're going to help people out. But are you telling me that the, the, the U.S. government won't respect the service laid by one of its countrymen saving others? Are you kidding me? There's some piece of legislation that is going to block Glenn from getting his due. And look, we're not talking about millions of dollars here. I just wanted him to get whatever the normal life insurance would have been for what happened. So we file a lawsuit in federal court. I go to court in San Diego and Michael Mortensen's on my side. Greg Doherty flew down to, to, to hang out and, and check it all out. And a judge gets in front of us and there's representatives from Rutherford insurance there. And um, she looks at me, we do this little back and forth and she's like, I'm sorry. They're right. You're going to lose this lawsuit. You're going to lose. I'm like, what? Like how? And she looks at them and she kind of admonishes them in the courtroom. And she's like, shame on you for even having a business and a policy where, where this could happen. And yes, technically like you don't have to pay this. Like, but it's, it's morally wrong. It's morally corrupt. Um, mm-hmm. And I lost. So I wasn't done. I was just, I lost. <laughs> so I was still can pissed. I, and, can I ask a detail real quick, Sean? Yeah. So is the only reason they're not paying out is because he wasn't married and didn't have kids. Was that the only reason they weren't paying it out? Yeah. Like literally there, there's a piece of legislation that was written in the 1940s called the Defense Base Act. And there's a clause in the Defense Base Act that discusses the, the idea of getting life insurance and getting paid. Like, like, you know, if you're dismembered, it was like kind of like hurt or death, like, you know, cause obviously anything could happen. Mm-hmm. And the qualifications were being married and having dependents. Like th- those were like, like back in the forties, that was what it took. And if you weren't, I guess you just didn't really count. I don't know. Um, huh. But in 2012 and, and today, that is some majorly antiquated legislation. Well, yeah. I didn't think I had a chance at changing the legislation, but well, hold go on, ahead. go back one second. So he's required to have this policy, even though, so he's having to pay for a policy that he, if he, if anything happens, he will never see the money. Correct. Okay. Sorry. I'm just, <laughs> I've heard pieces of this and I'm just making sure I'm in the right brains. Keep going. So. Yeah, man. So, so let me give you another example. So Tyrone Woods died on that rooftop with Glenn. And I didn't mm-hmm. know Ty. Um, I knew his wife a little bit, um, Dorothy. She she was actually our dentist, um, small world community. Yeah. Um, Dorothy was married to Ty and they had a young child. So Dorothy was paid hmm. the due life insurance policy. She never had the issues that I had because she was married. She was the next of kin. She was the listed beneficiary. Like she, you know, she had all the same things in place that I had in place. However, she was married. She had children and Glenn was single and he did not have children. So that's just the way the cookie crumbled. And so I lawyered up ridiculous and went after, you know, Rutherford insurance and department of labor. I think it was and lost. So that was kind of part one of, 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 dealing with this stuff. So there was, there was sort of some immediate things and I, and I guess we can pause here and I'll talk about strategy. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for the team at KNL Gates for this. So we talked a lot about like, like what after the foundation was started, like protecting Glenn's legacy and, and how does this go forward? And there was sort of this immediate thing. The immediate thing was Glenn was denied his life insurance policy that should go to his family. And that's bullshit. And we're going to fight for that. Um, the second thing that we thought about and I really thought about was, well, what about Glenn's teammates? Like, I know the guys that serve in GRS that serve overseas. A lot of them are single. A lot of them, when they get out of the Navy are divorced. Like they don't have kids or, or you know what I mean? Like it's, they're broken yeah. families. There's a lot of situations that aren't as cookie cutter as w- how that legislation was written. Like how do we protect them so that this never happens again? Like that's, how do we how do we unfuck that paperwork? And then the third part was kind of how do we project Glenn's legacy in the future? Like the future of, of how Glenn is going to be remembered by this nation. And, and it's not just the foundation. 
Um, so those three things were all at play. And it was sort of like short game, medium game, long game. And from you know the end of 2012, after Glenn died, to last year, um, it's been this you know 11 year journey through each of those. And I took until I think it was the end of 2015 uh, or, or early 2015. I got a meeting with the director of the CIA, John Brennan. And I went into the CIA's office and the whole point was at this point, I lost the lawsuit and I wanted to learn about the Defense Base Act and Glenn's contract. I wanted to see his contract with the CIA. Like, how would Glenn have signed up for this? He's a smart guy. He wouldn't just knowingly get an insurance policy that would never pay out. Like, I just, he's too smart for that. So they show me his employment contract and it's totally redacted, like fucking black lines through everything. Like mm. Glenn Doherty signature. I'm like, cool assholes. Like, thanks. That that's <laughs> going to really help me out. Um, and then I get taken up into a room and it's John Brennan's office or like, so some meeting room up there. And John Brennan walks into the room. Again, remember, this is the director of the CIA. This guy's on the news like every week and he's there. I'm there. Uh, Glenn's sister, Kate, is in the room. And then like 12 lawyers all around us. And we sit down at this little table and it's just, we're, we're like this, eye to eye. And we have a couple light questions about who Glenn was and, and, and what he meant. And, and I just kind of got to the point. I, I, at this point, I got nothing to lose. I'd already lost the lawsuit. I'm pissed. And I just got done reading Glenn's contract, which was totally redacted. And I'm like, you know what? You know, Mr. Brennan... <laughs> you have the ability to do what's right. I don't believe for a second that you can't navigate how to reach into your pocket and pay Glenn's family their due. I just don't believe that. Like you, there, there has to be a, some sort of discretionary secret squirrel fund in your office to do the right thing. And I said, and I, I think it's absolutely ridiculous that that, hasn't happened and that this family has to live knowing that their government will not show the respect to one of their fallen. I said, it's just, it, you know, it turns my stomach. I said, now, I guarantee you, and this is the threat part of all this. There are a lot of newspapers outside of this office that would love to sit down and talk with me about that subject. If you don't do the right thing. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh my God. I just threatened to like <laughs> blow the whistle and go public to the director of the CIA. I just like kind of got up in his shit about Glenn and my best friend. And I remember he looked at me, he was a very calculated individual. And he said, we'll look into it. And he gets Ugh. up and he walks away. And I'm like <laughs> getting kicked under the table from Katie. Like, what the fuck are you doing? And <laughs> then we get out of the office. And I remember, you know, one of the attorneys was kind of like, that was good. That was really good. And there, she's like, she's like, he doesn't say anything to anyone. The fact that he said that means hmm. something. And I'm like, oh, yeah, means maybe I'm not going to get whacked in the parking lot. Yeah. Um, you're yeah. talking about the CIA here, right? <laughs> so I go home and about six months later, I get another call from, you know, the, the, the attorneys at k &L Gates and they say, hey, um, you're not going to believe this, but we got some correspondence from the attorneys and um, they're actually going to like, they're going to take care of this. And I'm like, really? And, and I want to give a shout out because like the main attorney who helped really drive this initiative was a woman named Amy Carnival. And, and Amy was the one I was my usual point of contact. And she, she was just all about it. And, and she had the fight in her and she was very diplomatic, unlike myself. And she, she said, yeah, um, it, it, it's going to take a while, but they're going to pay Glenn's death benefit. And we were just like, Oh my God, this is amazing. Like, this is amazing. She said, well, it gets better. They're actually going to take this same gesture and they found dozens as in more than two dozen families 
that were affected by this problem the same way Glenn was that date all the way back to Beirut. Now, I don't know if you guys remember the Beirut terrorist attack in like 1982 or something, but it was like, it was a while ago. Like I was a kid when that happened. I was like 10 years old. And they're like, yeah, we're, I was negative. The CIA, seven. Yeah. You weren't, you weren't born yet. <laughs> I don't think John was born either. Um, and that's fine. Cause it's in the history books. Just Google Beirut terror attacks. But mm-hmm. you know, what Amy said was like, they're going to honor all of those families. And sure enough, oh, wow. I think it was by like early 2016, they had, um, or 2015, whenever, they had paid out all of those families. So we're talking millions of dollars got released, you know, to all of these families. And let's say it was 500,000 per family, you know, somewhere in that ballpark. You're talking about dozens of families. So they really went back. And we got emails and phone calls through Glenn's foundation. His families were like, oh my God, thank you so much. Like this never would have happened if you hadn't fought and you hadn't like really pushed to make this happen. This never would have been addressed. Thank you. And it just felt so whole and healing to know that we had helped dozens of families that got quite frankly screwed over from family members that had laid down their lives and they might've been electricians or plumbers, you know, intelligence officers, contractors, like who knows, but they were over there serving their country yeah, and they died. And now they were taken care of. They were made whole. And so I really, you know, I want to pause here and say that John Brennan did Glenn a solid and he did this country a solid because I don't know that he knew, like he probably didn't know any of this stuff. He took in the information mm-hmm. from a really fired up mass hole, me, and, you know, he did something about it. Um, the last thing he did was really substantial because I had wanted to future proof what happened to Glenn. And I had wanted the CIA to write in language to onboarding contractors like Glenn, like the future of the GRS workforce, to warn them about the insurance policy debacle. Like, just put some language in there that tells these guys to be fair warning. If you die and you're single, you're not going to get paid out of life insurance policy. And well, they, they did one better than that. And again, this is like the last high five to John Brennan and his administration, like that, 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 that team of lawyers at the CIA. They actually wrote in a clause. It's called a memo, which sounds very informal, but apparently it's, it's like a binding legal document inside of the U.S. government or at least in the CIA that said, if this happens again, any future contractors, regardless of marital status or, or, or dependent status, will be paid the death benefit for their service to this country. So it's baked. Like, it's future-proofed. And... I'm not only thrilled that dozens of families in arrears were taken care of, like it just, it puts a giant smile on my face knowing that, you know, we took that energy and that, that fight and they received it and did the right thing. And now I know that Glenn's future brothers, you know, this next generation of warfighter that that is going to work for the CIA, that is going to protect our assets overseas are going to be protected in death as, as best that, that, you know, uncle Sam could do. And it was worth it. It was worth the anger and the sleepless nights and the frustrations and all that shit to, to make it happen. Like I'm, I'm, I'm truly thrilled that, that that was it. And the last piece to all of this, the, the third part has been celebrating Glenn's legacy for future generations. And it was Amy's idea, Amy Carnival's idea to take a swing at getting Glenn and the other Americans that were killed overseas awarded the congressional gold medal, which Mm -hmm. is the highest civilian honor that Congress can offer. And it's a commemoration. It's, it's like a medal, like a physical medal um, for Glenn's service and the other Americans killed over there. And it took nine years of lobbying the U S Senate and Congress to get this thing passed. And I flew out to DC three different times to meet with congressmen and senators to implore on them that this bipartisan piece of, of legislation should be passed 
and they should sign on board with it. And I got a front row seat to partisan BS politics. Yeah. And That's absolutely insane I'm really, that it took that long. Nine years. Yeah. You know who got, like, I think Tiger Woods got a congressional gold medal before <laughs> Glenn and the Americans killed over there. Like, what? Come on. <laughs> it's the most ridiculous thing so, I've ever heard. It is. And it took a lot. Like, th this took a lot of fight. So it's funny. I, I had to pull a car. Like, we were, re we, we failed in two congressional sessions to get this passed. Like, we didn't get enough votes. Um, hey, we just got balloons, though, that said that we did get a pass. So that's great. Um, <laughs> say, why are there balloons on your screen? <laughs> I don't know. Cause I did this or something. I don't know. Something happened. I don't know. Gang signs turned into balloons. Uh -huh. Anyways, like it's, it's, it's November of 2022 and the congressional session's about to end and we don't have enough votes. We need seven U S senators to sign on or this thing dies. And if it died, then we were done. Like after nine years, you know, the attorneys were like, we just can't keep doing this. We can't keep doing this. And Glenn's sister, Kate, and I were we, like, everyone was like, how long can we fight for this one? And we were so freaking mm -hmm. close. We just needed these seven U.S. senators. So when I was at Burton, you know, this is a Vermont based snowboard brand. I worked with a guy named Dave Driscoll. And Dave and I, you know, I, I loved working with Dave. He was great fun. We had reconnected in probably 2018. We hadn't talked in years and, and reconnected in 2019, 20, like, you know, over the pandemic. And he was like, Sean, I'm a dad. And I see that you're, you know, you're being really fit. And what do you take? What do you do? What's this bub stuff? And I think I sent him out some gear and, 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 you know, I was trying to like encourage, I always encourage all my friends to be healthy. And he was like, oh, that's great. So I, I called Dave up. It's right before Thanksgiving. I'm like, Dave, I got a favor. I never ask you for anything and I'm asking now and I really need this. Um, your stepdad is a U.S. Senator named Bernie Sanders. And I knew that Dave ran, like was involved <laughs> in his foundation. And like, you know, he grew up like Bernie's his dad. And I'm like, are you having Thanksgiving with Bernie? And he said, yes, I am. I said, okay, I need you to sit down. I need you to tell him about Glenn and I need you to get him to sign on to the congressional gold medal because if Bernie signs, everyone else will sign. They'll do what Bernie says. And I had a couple other names of senators, but like this was my direct line. I'm like, I know a guy. And um <laughs> and he did. He talked to Bernie. And like Monday after Thanksgiving, Bernie went into the office. Keep in mind, like the congressional session ended like a week later. We had a very short window. Bernie signs this thing and like Amy and they've called me up. They're like, how did you get Bernie Sanders to sign this thing? And I'm like, I, you know, I knew a guy. Um, so, and that, that, that did it. Like all of a sudden it felt like dominoes, like seven, eight other not yet. It was way more than we needed. Everyone else signed up after Bernie did. And we got this thing passed. So I, I went on Christmas of 2022, you know, like what year and a half ago, they signed the congressional gold medal into law. Biden signed it privately in his office. It wasn't a big to do. Um, and now I'm waiting, you know, here it is, you know, February of 2024 sometime this year, the congressional gold medal will be awarded. There'll be a public ceremony and we'll be celebrating Glenn's legacy kind of in its, in its full force. And I can't wait, man, to, to be able to do that. Cause it was a long fight. Uh, it was worth every painful step along the way to get there. Um, but, you know, to see that Glenn's fighting brothers were taken care of, that Glenn's family was taken care of, that all those other families affected by that legislation were taken care of, you know, it it, it feels good. And, and it's going to feel really good to know that there's a congressional gold medal that will probably be, you know, hung in the CIA's uh, museum. I imagine that'll be its final resting place uh, to commemorate Glenn's service mm -hmm. to his country. Um, it's going to feel really good. And, and right now, you know, having this conversation with you guys, like it, it reminds me how good it feels to have a brand named after Glenn and all the great things that he stood for. That's a crazy story. <laughs> I didn't know yeah. that's where we were going today. Um, I, 
me That's neither. That's insane. But, but yeah, you, <laughs> you get a spotty internet connection that you got to kind of recalibrate your conversation. It goes from deadbeat, derelict, partying, pro snowboarder to suing the U.S. government. Um, and, and here we are. <laughs> and changing the lives for tons of families. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That's, wow. We're going to have to so switch I, up how we do the, go, go Jonna. I was just going to say, I've, I mean, I've heard this story thousands of times and just hearing it today, even still, I'm like, this is like, it feels really special to be a part of Bubs. And like, I'm really excited for people to learn more about it because a lot of people don't know like the details and like, it's just like so powerful and so moving and so much more than a brand. And it's just, I'm really excited for this podcast. Thanks. Me too. I, I, I really yeah. am. And like, it, it's funny, like the, the whole cult of recreationalism name, like the whole idea of that, and like what it's all about, like, what's the point in being super healthy if you're not going to use it? What's the point in having the energy in your soul and not putting it to work? And you know, yeah, I had grief and anger and frustration to fuel me. Mm-hmm. But now, you know, kind of looking back on that, it was probably the healthiest, most productive thing I could have done with, you know, with where I was, you know, in my life and, and where I think the country was and where Glenn's friends and family were like, it was, it it was the right thing to do. We could have done a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. Um, I could have not fought the government. I could have not been a part of a lot of that. I could have holed up and, or, or just been private about it. And it wasn't the right thing to do. It didn't feel right. This, this feels right. And telling the story now, like I've never talked about this before. Like I've never like gone out publicly and been like, I'm going to record an episode of a podcast. I'm going to talk about suing the government. Um, And that's some scary stuff to go through. Like it's really scary to be in a room with the director of the CIA sweating bullets, telling him how mad you are and that you're going to call the (laughs) New York times and blow the whistle on, you know, what a shitty man he is. Um, and then knowing that, you know, years later that he actually did him a solid and, and was a good guy. And like, and I think that's our default as, as people is like, you know, people want to do the right thing mm. and uh, we had a chance to do the right thing. So yeah, it's pretty cool. And now we, we got an episode in the books here um, and I cried. So fuck you guys for making me do that. <laughs> you did to yourself. Man. I was starting to tear up too. I know. Like, Every time, I was heavy. telling Nathan before this, I'm like, I hear the story all the time, but every time I get like choked up and this time was even more so every time. Yeah. I mean that whole funeral procession, like it was oh, bananas gosh. to see just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of people holding flags. Like as you're just driving down your old hometown, like you know, where I grew up, Yeah, it was stirring to say the least. It's um, giving me goosebumps. Just even thinking, I like tear up during the national. Yeah, I, was anthem, just so I can't imagine that. something that powerful and in, in your hometown and yeah, mind blowing. Yeah, mm. it, it just it brings it all mm. back to like, you know, if I ever think about the division in this country, or if I think about what's mm. happening, all the wrong things, like you have those moments where, where as a nation, we can get brought together, and and I really take strength in in knowing that that's in us. And, and sure, it's stressed right now as a country, but it's in us. And, and yeah. you know, God forbid we have to get tested like that again. But, you know, like I do take comfort from knowing that, hey, man, we're, we are Americans first. We're, we're here grateful for our freedom. And these are things that are, are worth fighting for. So, um, yeah, great, great episode. Um, at some point, we should probably tell people how we actually decided to start a nutrition brand. Uh, you know, hey, <laughs> that that was the goal for. So yeah, we're just gonna have to. I'll I'll put something at the beginning of this episode of like, hey, so we started going this direction and it shifted. <laughs> so, um, but we'd like uh, to thank a spotty internet connection for rerouting this story into uh, the episode that's called "We Made Sean Cry." <laughs> yeah. Aww. So, but uh, um, no, thank well, this is great. Sean. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all of that. I feel like that's going to, there's, I had heard pieces of this story, but I'd never mm-hmm. heard it all together. And like, this is, I'm excited for people to listen to this and like, yeah, just leave it at that. So yeah, me too. Me too. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share it and you know, I have a goal for sharing it. Like I want to tell this story. Like I want to get in front of it and it's, 
you know, it, it's, it's, it's a lot of things for me, but you know, it, it, it's something I'm finally comfortable with and, and, and ready to share. And like, look at, this was a chapter of my life and it was a, a chapter in our nation's history. And it's a really great opportunity to talk about, you know, an adverse situation and a really positive outcome. And you've got a really shitty thing that happened and a really shitty next thing that happened. And then I think the best possible outcome you could hope for to celebrate a hero and celebrate our future heroes and take care of people that were unjustly affected by situations. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good with it. Yeah. So uh, on that note, we should probably wrap it up and, uh, you know, call it a day. Sounds good. Johnny, you have anything else to add before we close up? I do not. That was great. All right. All right. Cool. Well, guys, thank you for listening to the cult of recreationalism. Uh, until the next one. Cheers. Thank you.